as triumphs, in quotation marks, on the field of battle. Never once uttered this cry, I have triumphed. In all of those battles, in all of those single duels that he had, he never once said, I have triumphed. But here he has, the moment he's been struck on the head by a poisoned sword, he says, I have triumphed by God, by the Lord of the Kaaba. Only now, after being treacherously struck on the head while prostrate in prayer, did he make such a statement, as paradoxical a statement to the worldly-minded, as it is profound to those with a sense of eternity. He was demonstrating the highest meaning of his words in the discourse to Kamel just cited. He made easy what the extravagant find harsh. He befriended that by which the ignorant are alienated. He embraced warmly his death. What the extravagant and the ignorant are most frightened and alienated by, of course, is death. But for the Imam, death was only the removal of a veil that had already become transparent to him. By virtue of his spiritual knowledge, which is so perfectly attuned to divine mercy, this transformative synthesis of knowledge and mercy had already placed his heart in paradise. And that's a lesson which we can all learn from in a very concrete and direct way. That if we want our heart to inhabit paradise here and now, ask ourselves, is the knowledge I have of God and of paradise and of revelation and of the prophets and of the saints, of the Ahl al-Bayt, is my knowledge of these things suffused with divine mercy and compassion? If it is, then congratulations, your heart is beginning to inhabit paradise. If it's not, then work hard at polishing away everything in your heart that is contrary to divine mercy. Some telephone didn't like that message. <laughs> Imam Ali had triumphed because throughout his life it was this knowledge of divine mercy that had nourished his soul. As a mother's milk nourishes her suckling babe. I swear, he said, that the son of Abu Talib, he's referring to himself of course, but this wonderful way of objectifying himself, I swear that this person, the son of Abu Talib that's speaking, he is more intimate with death than is the babe with the breast of its mother. This is far from any morbid fixation on death as negation. Rather, it bears eloquent testimony to the fact that Imam Ali was already, in a mysterious sense, dead to the world. Not out of an indifference to this lower domain, but because his spiritual life, the life of his heart, was already pulsating inwardly in the radiance of divine Rahma, which paradise is. Rumi, most famous of all Sufi poets, tells us in the Masnavi that the Prophet gave a prophecy to Imam Ali, saying that this is the man who will kill you. Imam Ali says it according to the poetic vision of Rumi, and I'll conclude with these words from Jalaluddin Rumi. Day and night I see the murderer with my eyes, but I have no anger against him, because death has become sweet as manna to me. My death has laid fast hold of the resurrection. In other words, for Imam Ali, according to Rumi, for Imam Ali, death equals the ma'ad, the return, the resurrection. It's not about a negation or a finality, it's a return to one's true home. Tis death outwardly, Rumi says, again putting this in the words of Imam Ali, in the mouth of Imam Ali. Tis death outwardly, but it is life inwardly. Apparently, it is a cutting off. In secret, in reality, it is permanence, life without end. To the embryo in the womb, 
birth is going from one state to another. But in the world, the embryo blossoms anew. Slay me, now here Rumi uses the words, the famous words of Halaj. Uqtuluni ya thiqati. Slay me, my trusted friends. Slay me, vile as I am. Verily in my being slain is my life forevermore. Inna fi, in the Arabic, it's inna fi qatli hayati. So I'll finish with those words.